Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. We're here with Dino Colombo today from the great state of West Virginia. And uh, Dino, I know you, you've been practicing a while. How long have you been practicing now? 35 years now, Dan. A long time. Yeah, you got a lot of gray hair to show for it because I can see it I on sure the do. Comment yeah. on that. So, <laughs> Dino, for, uh, you know, tell us, how did you... You know, how did you decide to become a lawyer and slash a trial lawyer? Yeah, well, that's a that's a good good question. The truth of the matter is, I was a I went to undergraduate school at West Virginia University here in Morgantown, which is where I live, and um, I was in business school like a like a lot of other people are, and um, I had a business law class. A guy, an older gentleman by the name of of George Markusic, and I, I speak of George very fondly. He was a adjunct professor, an older gentleman, but this guy was full of life, man. I'm telling you, he told you the way it is. It made perfect sense to me. It just hit me like I understood what this guy was saying. And, you know, my dad wasn't a lawyer. I have a, uh, I have a cousin who's a lawyer, but, but law really wasn't in my family. Uh, but George Marcuse, he's, he's deceased now, unfortunately, but he's the one that just put the, put the energy in me to be a lawyer. I understood what he was saying. It made sense. I'm kind of a black and white kind of guy. Truthfully, it's right or it's wrong. I, I understand there's shades of gray, but I'm, I'm a direct kind of guy up front. And George, George just hit me right with that and, and turned me on to law. And, and I became a trial lawyer because, frankly, I, I worked for the prosecuting attorney's office in Columbus, Ohio. Went to law school in Cap, at Capital University in Columbus. Met my wife. She's an Ohio State grad. But I worked for the prosecuting attorney's office while I was still in school. You see, in, in Columbus, Ohio, we, you were able to have, as a third-year law student, a special license. So I tried probably 200 bench trials while I was still in law school. These were juvenile delinquent cases to a bench. Those, those trials would last two hours, half a day, sometimes a whole day, but it was just me. And man, you made all kinds of mistakes and you did all kinds of crazy things and screwed things up. And, and sometimes you did the right thing and you would win those cases. But I'm a guy who, who doesn't mind standing up in front of people. I know that that's sometimes scary for people, but I don't mind public speaking. Uh, and it just is what I feel like I was meant to do. It's, it's, it's what I, it's my passion, frankly. That's, that's, well, where I, that's where I am. It's good when we're doing our passions because it makes uh, this thing called work a lot more fun. Well, you're not and, kidding. Uh, and it makes us a lot better at it too, you know what I mean? Like when it's a calling instead of a job. Yeah, I mean, George, Mark, like I said, Mark Kuzik was my business law teacher. I wouldn't want to do business law. It was a lot of contracts, a lot of, you know, that kind of thing. That's not what I wanted to do, but, but he really, connect, it really connected with me. And that's frankly why I'm a lawyer today. Well, you know... The reality is we all need um, people in our lives to, to be that great influence. And that was kind of like the impetus behind, you know, when, we, when I started Trial Lawyers University during the pandemic was I need to learn. You know, I want to be, I want to be a great trial lawyer, you know, a civil sure. trial lawyer. I was a criminal defense lawyer. I tried a lot of cases. But it's a whole different game being a civil trial lawyer. And the way I'm going to learn how to do this stuff is if people will mentor me, well, nobody's going to pick up, you know, take on some 45-year-old guy from, you know, who just wants to, like, you know, who's not going to do any grinding, you know, discovery and all the other bullshit that people have to do as they learn the process. Yeah. <laughs> that ain't ever to happen. So yeah. I had to find a way to maneuver it. So all these great trial lawyers would teach me everything they knew. And, uh, and, uh, you know, that kind of worked out, it worked out well for me and you yeah. know, a lot of other folks. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in, in law school, you do trial ad, you do various adv advocacy classes. A lot of my, my classmates were always worried about standing up in front of people. And they were worried about public speaking. They were really, really intelligent folks, but they just were, they didn't care to stand up and, and be, and talk in front of people. And it didn't bother me. So this is kind of what I think I was born to do. It's what I love to do. It's what I've been doing for 35 years. Well, you're lucky that it didn't, because like when I started out being a lawyer, I stuttered for the first six months of being a car. Like even saying my name, I was so nervous and so insecure. And I remember saying to one of my friends, I'm like, how long, did you start study? Did you study when you first went to court? He's like, yeah. I'm like, how long did that last? He's like, eh, a week. I'm like, fuck. I'm, 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 I'm three months into this. I'm having trouble putting words together still. So it didn't come naturally for me. And, and you know, and I, and I really think that, um, 
you know, standing up and presenting is a skill and, you know, one that to be developed, not just from trying, but also from, you know, mastering, like really the, you know, the, the science and technique of connection in front of a small group. And, you know, I've been working on figuring out how to teach this and been coaching people for a while and made a lot of progress on it. So for, you know, in case anybody says that natural, like me, I can help those people. Now the naturals, I think I can make better because I've never worked with anybody. I didn't think I'd be better. You're the best in the business at it. You really are. Well, we, you see my coaching program one day, because like I may be running it, I mean doing it at Trial Lawyers University in New York City. So there's be like ten people that would just be doing the boot camp for four days. Right. Because that is gonna be exciting to watch the transformation of those people. But let me ask you this, Dino, where you know, you're from West Virginia, you grew up what tell us a little bit about your background growing up so we get a better yeah. idea of who you are. Yeah. So you're right. I am from West Virginia. I grew up here. I've lived here most of my life. I lived in Ohio when I went to law school and, and worked at a law firm up in Cleveland for about a year. And then other than that, I've been in West Virginia my entire life. You know, as far as my family growing up, I don't have any any story where I had to walk uh, in the snow uphill backwards both ways to school, that kind of thing. I had great parents who, who loved us and who took care of us and who educated us and gave us great advice. Frankly, I'm a product of, of two wonderful parents. They're gone now, they've left us, but uh, I'm the product of two great parents. And you know, they, they made sure we got a good education and a good work ethic. I've been working, doing something since I was 14 years old. I'm gonna be 60 next week, so a long time. But my grandfather used to say that work is a blessing. And it absolutely is. I, I don't know what I would do if I wasn't working. John Romano, as you you know, John and I are very close friends. And, you know, I, I asked John one time, I said, when are you going to hang it up? And he said, Abs absolutely never. And, and he asked me the same thing. And I said, I'm afraid I'm going to be right there beside you because I don't know what I would do if I wasn't working. And as I said earlier, this is a, a passion of mine. And so I think that I'll be doing this for a long, long time. But, you know, I'm, I grew up in West Virginia. I went to law school in Ohio and at Colum in Columbus at Capital Law School. My wife was a graduate of Ohio State, and we have an office in Columbus right now, as you know. Travis Moeller and my son Nathan Colombo are are both lawyers there in our Columbus office, and uh, I get to Columbus frequently. I'm there probably once a week, once every other week. So we we are licensed both in West Virginia and Ohio. We cover the entirety of both states. And so we travel around and, and we're very active in the practice of law in both states. All right. So did you have any brothers and sisters? Did you play sports growing up? Yeah, I have a brother. He's also a lawyer. He went to Capitol Law School. He's a couple years behind me. He's a lawyer for Duke Energy down in Charlotte, North Carolina. He works in their renewable energy, deals with uh, solar energy and windmills. I have two children. One I mentioned a minute, minute ago, Nathan. Nathan's a lawyer, uh, works in our Columbus office. He's been out of school probably four years now. I have a daughter. Her name's Caroline. She's a commercial airline pilot, believe it or not. Wow. And, uh, yeah. So she uh, she works for a private company. She she flies a private jet. Uh, that company's out of North Carolina, and she's all over the all over the country every day. And very wow. proud of her. She's 28, and Nathan is 31. So yeah. Wow. I've, and I've been married to my wife Dawn for 34 years. All right. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good solid beginning. And, and well, and here, here's the other piece that people, people have asked me, and I think I gave an interview one time to uh, the National Trial Lawyers. They said, what do people not know about you? Uh, because I'm an advertising lawyer. I'm a, kind of an open book to, to people. A lot of people know who I am in our local community here. I said, what people wouldn't know about me is that I am also the owner of a, of a wine import business. We, I have two partners, they're also lawyers. We import red wine and, and white wine, but primarily red wine uh, from Italy and throughout Italy as well as Sicily. And we've been doing that about 10 or 12 years now. And it's been a wonderful uh, hobby for us. It's been a wonderful uh, uh, something to do other than uh, practice law. We like to drink red wine and, and our saying is, our, our saying is, if we can't sell it, we'll drink it because we only we only uh, import wine that we genuinely like and want our fr friends and family to have. So it's been a great it's been a great little uh, a side hustle for us, and we've really enjoyed it. Nice. Well, you said you talked about being an advertising lawyer. How long have you been advertising for, and how did that well, get started? Cause... Yeah, probably probably about twenty years now. Um, we have been a, a major advertiser in both West Virginia. Uh, and probably in the last six years, seven years in Columbus. So we're probably the number one advertising lawyer in our area here in West Virginia. And I think we're either number one or number two in Columbus. And it's been a, it's really been a good thing for us. Um, 
A lot of people don't like to advertise. They don't want their name on a billboard or their face on a billboard or TV or whatever. Uh, it doesn't bother me. As I said, I'm, I'm comfortable kind of being in the public, but uh, it has allowed us to be really, uh, we are direct to consumer advertisers. I mean, I, we take, we accept referrals. We get referrals from, from people because our kind of niche in our practice is we handle primarily truck accident cases. That's what we do. And that's throughout West Virginia and Ohio and really around the country. So we, we do accept referrals and, and we like working with other lawyers and learning from them as well. But it has given us a great deal of independence uh, to have clients contact us directly. Like, you know, we have, we, I don't know how many calls we've gotten today. I mean, we've get, we get lots and lots of calls every day uh, just from direct to, cons, you know, uh, clients contacting us. And about, it's, sometimes it's about truck accidents. Sometimes it's about a variety of other, you know, torts or injuries, malpractice, dog bite, whatever you might, whatever it might be. Or maybe like a, an estate probate question or a criminal question. It's quite happily like, let me give you this referral source here. Right, I, no, I had it I today. Don't move, I, I got the guy for you. Yeah, I had it today. I had to. I had a client, a former client of ours, that we represented a huge truck accident case, got a gigantic result for her, and she had a a, a will issue and a, a question about a will and a tr and a estate question. So she was supposed to come in today at three o'clock, but she had to reschedule. So anyway, right. Yeah. All right. So so let's talk about being a trial lawyer. And uh, what would you say your uh, top qualities that you possess to make you you know, the trial lawyer you are, you know, to make you a winning trial lawyer, because yeah. being a losing trial lawyer sucks. <laughs> it does suck. But let me tell you this, being a losing trial lawyer, I think you learn more losing than you do winning. Okay. Well, now, nobody likes saying, saying, because, you know, if you don't sleep for a month after you lose a case, and you replay it over and over and over in your mind, everything you could have done differently, that yeah, you're going to learn from it. But your next trial, you'll do a better job. But anyway, what I would say is this, I would say, Probably my best quality. If if you hate to talk about yourself, and it's the only well, let's just say let's let's talk about you. What three qualities would you say are necessary to have at a high level? Quality or character traits to, for somebody to be a champion or winning traveler. Forget about Dino. Yeah, other people. I would, I would say the first thing, and this is gonna you're gonna think I'm 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 crazy for saying this. You have to be willing to learn. Okay, and here's let me tell you what I what I mean by that. Uh, I had a I had a partner. His name was Rich Stewart, and I love Rich, and we're still good friends. And he taught me to be the lawyer that I am. I mean, he's was a wonderful guy, and he retired probably ten years ago, and and I bought him out of the practice, and and I, I love him, and he's probably still to this day one of the best lawyers I've ever dealt with. But it was hard to tell Rich things. He wouldn't want to listen to others to tell him how to take a deposition, how to try a case. I think one of the most important things that any trial lawyer can can do or trait they need to have is the willingness to learn. The willingness to learn from other people. It might be a more experienced lawyer, an older lawyer, or it might be a young guy, all right? I mean, Travis Moeller, I think you know Travis from my office. Travis one of the smartest guys I know. We debate, he and Nathan and I, we debate everything together. And we, we take each other's advice. Sometimes I tell him he's crazy. Sometimes he tells me I'm crazy. And we go back and forth. But we debate these things. We debate how we're going to take this deposition. We debate how we're going to pick this jury and, and question this witness and all the different motions we're going to file. And I have to be, I'm going to be 60 years old next week. I need to be willing to learn from a 30-year-old. A OK, and there's a lot of lawyers out there who are my age or, or around my age that think, look, I've done it all. I've tried all these cases. I'm good. I got it. Well, let me tell you what. That's bullshit because you don't have it because there's a lot of other really good thoughts and opinions that you might be able to improve your case or improve your skills. So what I would say is that you have to have the ability and willingness to learn. That's huge. And, and, and right now, and, and Dan, you're a product of it right now, you are teaching people, all right? Panish is teaching people. Mitnick is teaching people. Lanier is teaching people. John Romano, me, Satch Oliver, Joe Freed. We're all coming to these things. We're teaching others, and we are being taught, right? We are being taught. You're talking about some of the, the premier lawyers in the country, excluding me, because I don't put them, myself in that category. Those are some of the premier lawyers in the country. They are still learning today how to better their craft. And that is huge. It's extraordinarily important for people to do. Because let me tell you, they call it the practice of law for a reason. 
okay? Because it is the practice. That's what I think. And I would agree with you. I consider it kind of having like the beginner's mindset. You're always being curious, like, why? Why'd you do that? That's why I love doing my case analysis program. We're going to do yours, I think, in uh, September 5th on a recent trucking verdict. But it's like, you know, you, you somebody to break down a trial and explain to you all their decisions they made from how they structured their opening to the questions, how they framed their questions in voir dire to how they, you know, did their money ask and all that stuff. Every day it's just like I get so many – insights from different lawyers and it's just so exciting because that's a great thing about being a trial lawyer is like you get to keep learning it doesn't get boring and it's always changing the thing is in our practice of law and on the plaintiff side of this all of these fantastic lawyers are willing to share their secrets it's really an amazing thing right uh, all of these fantastic lawyers are willing to tell you how they got to this big verdict, what mistakes they made, what they did right, what they did wrong. Th that's almost unheard of. Uh, because, no. cause in, go ahead. I, I know, I'm just saying, like, absolutely, like, I tell you, everybody, you know, it's like, and people say, wow, verdicts are so big these days. I wonder how that's happening. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with that so many plaintiffs' lawyers were really, you know, sitting there and studying every day. And because the pandemic, took away so much from us, our connections with other human beings, that it, I think it caused so many people to start opening up and sharing more and realizing that, you know, that by sharing, they are actually getting more because, you know, the benefit of changing other people's lives, of actually experiencing that and the wanting, to, you know, the desire to connect. Because when, you know, like COVID, I was all by myself in my apartment in L.A. By myself for literally months. I'd go out and walk the streets. But they were kind of, you know, especially in the beginning, they were kind of vacant, go out and try to get some carry-out food, but just to be around other people. And so I think COVID really caused people, the great trial lawyers who were all by themselves, to actually open up and share more. And when somebody started opening up and sharing, they saw other people do that. Like, I got to share too, or I'm going to be a fraud, bullshit, if I'm just throwing shit out there to get business and not really trying to teach people. So between that and, you know, with the access to information these days, it, you know, and, you know, and frankly, you know, not to, but like, you know, programs like my, my boot camp where I teach connection and, you know, con, you know, because connection, when all those people that aren't comfortable, like me, stuttered forever. And, you know, without a coach, like what's, what's appropriate eye contact? Oh, if you stare too much, it's weird. Well, that's not helping me any. That's not teaching me a skill with the right. repetition or where do my hands go? You know, they, I've seen people tell people, if you're nervous, just touch your fingertips together. I'm like, yeah, you're standing in front of people like this. You look like a weirdo. Who yeah. stands like this? Weirdos. And you can't connect if you're nervous. So you got to train enough that you get calm, that right. you relax. Yeah. And, you know, and so my, I tell people the only thing stopping you from being a great trial lawyer, a champion trial lawyer, is you. Because the path is there. You have to, you have to walk it. Nobody's going to carry your ass there. But if you want it, it's all there. And, it's, and so if you don't become a great trial lawyer, it's because you chose not to. It's not because it was anything stopping you, but you chose not to, and you should live with that. You know, if you want immediate, if just, you know, having a balanced life or, you know, being comfortable and, you know, all that for you, that's important. That, that's your life. You know, but I don't know too many trial lawyers that have these balanced lives because it doesn't really work. Because when you're in trial, there is nothing else except a trial. But you've so, got to be able to set your ego aside. I don't care how successful you are. You have to be able to set your ego aside and learn and listen to others. You know, uh, John Romano and I were talking about we wanted to have a do a seminar one time where we talked about cases we lost. Right. Why'd you lose this case? No, everybody, you go to these seminars, everybody wants to talk about this multi-million dollar verdict and we did this and we kicked this guy's ass and that guy's ass and blah, blah, blah. Well, how about the cases that you lost? Because if all you're doing is winning cases, then you're not trying enough cases, okay? And, and the reality- You're not trying hard cases. You know. Well, you're not trying hard cases, that's right. And so, you know, but I think as lawyers, no matter how successful we are, we have to have the ability to set our ego aside and to genuinely want to learn. I mean, because I genuinely want to learn. The truth of the matter is I've tried, you know, I've tried 80 to 100 cases, right? I've tried a lot of cases. I have a pretty good idea what's going on, but I don't know at all. And let me tell you, earlier today, I'm debating with Travis and Nathan about, because I'm getting ready to try a case here in a couple of weeks, about whether or not we introduce the medical bills or, or, or whether that's going to be too low of an anchor. And there's a lot of pros and cons on that because it's, couple hundred thousand dollars in medical bills and we don't know it, I don't go into all the details but I want to know what they think right you know those guys don't have nearly the experience that I do but they're smart guys 
I mean, they know what's up. And so they have great, great thoughts and opinions about how the, the pros and cons of that. And at the end of the conversation, we decided not to introduce the bills. But I need to have that back and forth. There's a really good lawyer here in West Virginia. I won't name his name. Uh, one of the smartest guys I know. He was a defense lawyer. But he would never ask anybody any questions. He didn't focus group cases. He didn't have associates he bounced things off of or paralegals or anything. He thought he knew. And sometimes he did, but sometimes he didn't. And the sometimes he didn't turned out to be big disasters for him because he would never stop and ask and never stop and learn. Well, if so, he was a defense lawyer, that's good. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. He's giving that money away. I mean, every big verdict, let's just be honest. I've never seen a big verdict that wasn't at least 50 to 60% the responsibility of the defense lawyer. Never I, seen it. I agree 100% because with you. It's only I their agree. stupid behavior that pisses people off when people are pissed. Now we're talking money. So, right. and, and I know we're going to talk about things, you know, about different cases and this kind of thing. But w what I keep seeing, and, and Dan, what you just said is exactly 100% accurate. It's, it, these big verdicts are driven by just terrible mistakes that people make on the defense side. They say things that they can't prove. They make representations that they can't back up. They make themselves look foolish. Their demeanor is crappy. Their, their statements to the jury are wrong. And they don't seem to care. And you know why? Because nobody has trained them. Nobody taught them. And that's the difference. When I, when I started practicing law, I was, I was a med mal defense lawyer for maybe 15 years, probably half of my career or more, was a med mal defense lawyer. And, but I worked for a firm where they trained you. We learned the medicine. We tried the cases. We had two or three lawyers on every case who actually participated. We tried, one year I tried 11 cases in one year. In one year, big malpractice cases. We tried a ton, we tried a ton of cases. All right? That's a lot of trials for med mal. You're not kidding, all right? But the point, though, is we had good senior lawyers who taught you, who taught you how to behave in front of a jury, taught you how to behave in front of a judge, in front of a client. So you make yourself look foolish and make representations you couldn't back up. I, I wouldn't be where I am without that training. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just we just tried a case, and I, you know that you referenced we got a uh, just over seven million dollar verdict on. Travis Moeller was a primary lawyer on that. I was kind of the coach in the whole thing. And Travis did just a fantastic job in it in preparation. And he and my son, Nathan, just knocked it out of the park. Well, but, what the hell do we got you on this for? Where's Travis? That's right. Travis needs to be on. <laughs> when we do that webinar, we're going to have Travis and Nathan on. All right. All right. But the, but the point is, though, that defense lawyer, it, the mistakes that were made on that case are unforgivable. Unforgivable. No, anyway. they're forgivable with money. What are you talking about? Yeah. The verdict yeah. forgives it. It forgives everything yeah. with money. Come on, do you know yeah. what? We are in the money justice business. You see, that's yeah. what it says on the back of the TLU shirts. Money justice. The, right. We're on the money justice tour. So just so you, just so you can fire it up. See that? See that? Money, money justice. justice. There it is, that's baby. That's right. That's all we're looking for is money. Not, we're, not, we're not here for saris. We're not here for, uh, you know, whatever. Just for money. But let me ask you this. So, Willingness to learn, the beginner's mindset. That's yes. number one. Give me the second quality, not of yours, but you would say great trial lawyers. I'll give you two, and they're kind of combined. One is pre preparation, and I'm sure everybody who's everybody knows that, but preparation. But the other thing is practice. I mean, it's actually the practice. To stand in front of a mirror and do opening statement. To, okay. stand, in, to stand in your office with the door open or closed and go through your voir dire, okay? In the case I'm getting ready to try here on July 19th, this is kind of a, this is a county where we've already picked the jury. We picked the jury last week, believe it or not, for a trial that's not going to take place until July 19th. Screwed up situation, but that's the way this county does it. All right? All right, fine. I've been there. I've been to those stupid counties in Michigan. Yeah, all right. So we picked it. So the, the two or three days before jury selection, I'm in my office with the door closed, going through my voir dire, standing up on my feet, walking around as if I would be questioning the jury, questioning where my feet are, where my hands are, the tone of my voice, what's going to happen if they say something back to me that I don't expect. So I am practicing that. And then as we approach the trial, I'll be practicing that opening statement. And sometimes we even video so, videotape ourselves, and I'll probably do that here. And I'll watch the video. Here's the thing. I, 
on examination of witnesses, I read it in the deposition. I've taken tons of depositions, obviously. After a witness says an answer, I say, all right, all right. So every, every time I, right, I don't even know it. I never well, even What do you say to that for? You're killing it. Right. With those but, verbal pauses. A guy, you, you're a senior status. You're still doing that. Bull man, you need some right. coaching. Don't worry. I got somebody to help you. <laughs> I'll help you break those bad habits. There don't you, you worry about no, that. I, all, broke right? myself, I broke them myself by watching and reading what I was doing is what I'm saying. Good. When I was, I was going, all right, all right, all right. But the point, though, is it is the practice. It is the videotaping of watching yourself. I know people don't like to, to watch themselves on TV. Frankly, I'm on TV so much that I'm used to it. So, but the point is, so I'm watching myself on TV, on the video, and seeing how my mannerisms are, how my tone of voice is, how my eye contact is, because all of that's incredibly important. And the more prepared you are, the more confident you will be in your presentation. OK, so the more the more, you know, the facts, the more, you know, where you want to take a witness and how to get that witness to where you want to be, the more confident you will be in that examination. Very simple. I absolutely agree. And I am going to recommend a couple things. One is that you never practice in the mirror again because some weirdos talking to you, disrupting your connection and you can't make eye contact with your own eyes. And so for people that do my training, I send them, I call them juror boards, which are you know two by three boards with people's faces, just headshots on it to line them up like on easels. And then put a, you know, and, and I would strongly suggest that you record everything you do from your voir dire's. And then if you just have one person like Ethan or sit there and they give mock answers as you're staring at the board. And so that way you practice the patterns. I mean, you know, obviously once you get your voir dire structured, in the sequence that you want them, how you want to frame the questions, that I think doing a live focus group is very important because it gets the feedback and you know the patterns of that conversation. And you know, recording yourself, you can see your own pacing, you know, your own hand movement, you know, because these kinds of things. Because like when you're talking to one juror, like I see so many like so many prestigious lawyer, you know, lawyers that are great lawyers, when they're talking to a jury, they always stand like this with their hands bouncing like this, which which is like insane to me because. I'm trying to connect here. So if I'm trying to connect here, why would I not keep my hand a couple inches below my chin and move it with the rhythm of my voice between your face and my face? That's going to connect us, not blah, blah, blah with these things distracting you in your lower peripherals. But all these little things matter. They all add up to this thing we call connection. And if you don't practice it and you don't watch yourself do it, you don't even know you're doing it. Oh, yeah. No, I know. It's like, and then so many times people are training with me and they're like, oh, I'm much better in the courtroom. I'm like, I'm sure you are when there's, you know, all this pressure and people yelling at you like judges and prosecutors. I mean, defense lawyers, I'm sure you're much better there right, right. than you are here where there's nothing on the line at all. Right. But, but let's just, you know, yeah. but we're just working on this right here. So right. those are your qualities of preparation, practice, and learning. That's the great thing. Since this is the toughest thing about, you know, like becoming a great trial. One of the difficult things about you know, becoming a great trial lawyer is what do you, what do you do? To, because if I could ask 10 lawyers, 10 very successful lawyers, great trials, what do you think the top qualities are? I'll get 10 different answers by a long shot. Then, and because there's no set, there's no set form. You know, it's like, you have to try to like determine what are these skills and then practice, you know, isolate, identify, isolate, and practice those skills. But speaking of skills, as a difference, as opposed to character traits, what skills do you, and by skill, I mean something like, that you can practice, you can develop, you get better at every day. So what skills would you say are the skills of great trial lawyers? I think the first thing is your, your tone of voice. I think the way in which you deliver the message. If you deliver the message deliberately with the right pauses, with the right stopping points, with, with the change in tone as, as the facts change, as you're telling a story. So I try to tell people, think about it like if you're reading a story to your son or your daughter when they were little. You, know, you want to emphasize certain facts. You want to downplay other facts. Some things are just, you know, filler. So I think the tone of voice, I think the, the uh, I tried a lot of cases with lawyers who basically read it off a piece of paper when they're giving opening statement, right? I mean, they-, they, they You tried a case with people that did that? Oh, oh absolutely, absolutely. Where people, where they're, they're so monotone, they, 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 whatever's on the paper, they're reading it or they're summarizing, no matter what the facts might be, they've already put it down, so they're going to go with what's on the paper, all right? You've got to live it, because here's what I think. 
and I really do think this after 80 plus trials, jurors are never going to really understand all the facts of your case. They're never going to understand them all, but they know who's telling the truth. They know who's giving them bullshit and who's not. Okay. And so they're never going to understand the nitty gritty details of your case. It's taken you two or three years to develop the case and get the facts and, and all the evidence kind of boiled down to your case. And, and you might have two days or two weeks or sometimes longer, it depends on who, what kind of case you're trying. But the jurors are never understanding all of those details. They got their own life going on. They're tired. They're, they're worried about dinner. Who's, who's, do I have food for the kids for dinner? Who's picking the kids up off the bus? Their mind wanders through this thing. But they know who's telling the truth. And, and credibility comes with truly believing in your case. Okay, so Dino, the first point is voice control controlling the pace, controlling the pausing, that's critical. And really your articulation is very important too because people that don't breathe enough and don't pause enough, sometimes their words kind of mumble together and then you lose your jury because now they start focusing on what the hell did that person just say or why doesn't that person care enough about me to clearly articulate what they want to say? So voice control, what's the next, what's the next one you think is right. real important? And before we move from voice control, the voice control also builds your credibility, okay? It builds your authenticity as well. Because you want this jurors, these jurors to hang on your words. What's he going to say next? What, why is he saying this? Where is he going with this? You want them engaged. You want to be telling the story. I don't know if you've ever heard John Romano. John and I have tried uh, several cases together. Man, you talk about a story storyteller. I mean, he's fantastic. And so, and so you want to be hanging on to every, every word. And so it builds your credibility which, and your authenticity. Your authenticity builds your credibility is what I would say. The other thing is this, or two other things I would say is this. You need to be able to control your reaction and your emotions to what's going on during trial and in dealing with the defense lawyers. So let me give you an example. If you go to the bench and you feel like the judge is screwing you and you feel very strongly about a point and the judge is you know, su sustaining the objection or, or, or excluding a, a key piece of evidence, you've got to maintain your composure. You're a professional, right? Because believe me, that jury is watching you. They're watching you if you're pissed off and shaking your head and, and rolling your eyes. And, 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 and frankly, they, they pick up if you're giving disrespect to the court too. All right. And you got to watch when you are walking out to the to the parking lot to put money in the meter or going to the bathroom or going to lunch. That jury is watching every move you make, your mannerisms, your your how you're speaking to your client or your legal assistant Are you know, many legal assistants are females. Some of them are males, but but oftentimes they're females. And so if you are, you know, if you are disrespectful to a um, a legal assistant, male or female, but particularly female, I'll just be blunt about it, you know, and a jury catches, juror catches that, your ass is in trouble. And it should be, right? Because let me tell you what, my paralegals are a key part of my success. And I introduce them in during voir dire. And I tell these juries, that's Linda and that's Teresa. And I wouldn't be successful without them. And not only is that true, but I want the jury to know that, okay? And so controlling your emotions, not only with the court, but with defense counsel. Let's face it, some defense lawyers are good people, good lawyers, treat you respectfully. Others are complete assholes. We see it, we deal with it. But if you get, if you let your emotions control you, if you let your emotions control you with, in front of the jury or with the defense lawyer, believe me, you're going to screw it up. I promise you. You will do things and you will say things and you will take positions that when you look back on it, you will say, what was I thinking? I promise you. That's, you know, that's sound advice. Absolutely. And, um, you know, as when I train people, you know, because I train them on state control, right? Controlling, like, having a warm place. Good morning, everybody. Or, like, having, like, when you ask a question, your face has to be, like, the inquisitive face. Because if you ask a question with a neutral face, well, the jury doesn't really know it's a question until they process it. Like, oh, that's a question. Whereas, like, like, does that make sense to everybody? Or, or can we all do this? Now they know by reading your face, it's a question. Then they hear the words that are congruent with the question. Now they're much more likely to participate in answering the question because everything's lined up. But if you're not practicing, you know, you're exactly right. Because this, this is a likability contest as much as anything else. I know. It just is.
And if 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 they like me and don't like you, I'm you're more the up. leg up. You're like a whole uh, torso up. I mean, I mean, you're way because right. you know it's it, it, it's it, it, but it takes practice to control the face. To you know, it takes practice to correct. Um, you know, shift it from neutral to inquisitive to concern to you know warm to ha you know I mean, these are all different emotions and we have to, be able to show every emotion and people got to be able to read it and it has to be congruent Absolutely. with what we're saying so the other thing a, a lawyer has to be able to do is this they got to be able to address their weaknesses in front of the jury address the weaknesses if 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 there's a weakness in your case and you you're representing a plaintiff in a car accident case and there's a big comparative fault uh, argument against you you know, and it's got some merit to it. There's some legitimacy to it. It's better just, and frankly, you build, again, it's all about credibility. You build your credibility by, look, say, look, let's address this up front. They're going to make a claim that Mr. Smith was driving too fast. The truth is he probably was driving a little too fast. But here's why that doesn't matter, okay? As opposed to acting like driving 80 and a 65 is no big deal, address it. It shows that you have confidence in your case. It shows that you're going to deal with the issue right up front and you diffuse it before the others get there. Because if you wait, they're going to screw you with it. If you don't raise it, it makes it look like you're hiding it. So break, bring up your, your uh, bad facts, point them out to them, turn those bad, bad facts into good facts. Turn your negatives into positive. Almost, almost. Almost every negative, if you think about it long enough and debate it long enough, maybe focus group things, talk to your colleagues, talk to your partners, you can come up with a positive spin on bad facts. But you've got to get your butt to work and start thinking about well, it. Well, speaking of getting our butts to work, we're going to get our butts to work in New York City September 20th to 23rd in Times Square. And we have, you know, like, I call it a murderer's row. You know, from the 1920 New York Yankees with Gehrig and Babe Ruth. And because, and like, especially for right in New York City between Ben Morelli, Ben Rabinovitz, Evan Torgan, Judy Livingston, Jeff Couric. I mean, we got the, you know, that's just from the city. But then from, you know, Mangaluzzi from Philly, from the East Coast. And, you know, and then, you know, like the Panish is coming out in Paris. I mean, I'm so excited about what's going to happen in New York. And, and I'm excited that you're going to be teaching there, too. So... Tell us, what are you going to be teaching? Yeah, we're going to be talking about innovative and creative advocacy. So what I'm going to talk to the folks about is this, about it's going to be kind of a broad, broad talk about very specific but very unique ways about how to address issues with the jury and most importantly, how to examine witnesses. So we go to these seminars, we learn, I've probably taken over a thousand depositions in my life, maybe more than that, all right? And so there are things I've done very well, there's things I've done very poorly. I have learned from people like Panish, Mitnick, Romano, Freed, Oliver, Morgan Adams, and we've taken all of their ideas and I've made them I've, I've worked on them my own, I've put my own thoughts, my own creativity in them. So we're going to talk about True false questions, for example. We're going to talk about road mapping, for example. Lanier. Lanier is, and I know you've been to the Lanier conference many times, as have I. You know, we're doing the road mapping. I'm going to show people how to do that road mapping on not the pharmaceutical four or five billion dollar case, but on the truck accident case, right? We're going to show how to use true false questions that really make a difference right? True false questions that are really demonstrative aids. That's really what we're doing. We're setting up the rules of the road as demonstrative aids, and I'm going to show people how to score huge points that will carry you through the case, carry you through mediation, carry you through the trial, so that you can say, what do you, when you go to the de defense lawyer, what are you going to do about this? All right, where you have the true false question and the key witnesses holding it up like it's a uh, like a mug shot. OK, I mean, it is fantastic stuff. And I wish I could tell you that I cr I came up with it all on my own head. I did not. I stole a little bit from Panish, a little bit from Mitnick, a little bit from here, a little bit from there. And I made it my own and I made it based on things that work for me and things that don't. I don't try five billion dollar pharmaceutical cases. I thought, You're only yeah. 60, dude. Don't, I, don't, I, don't I, just be patient. I, We're, and plus, we've only become friends recently, I so thought, you don't know how great your future is going to be. 
I try 20 and $25 million dollar uh, automobile and trucking cases, right? Well, hold that, on. That's hold what on, I hold do. On a second, Dino. But we all, the, yeah. Pardon my language, but yeah. how the F did you get a $7.5 million verdict? You messed up a $20 million case that badly? <laughs> I told you that was Travis's fault. Like Travis did that one. Okay, it was a learning curve. All right. <laughs> that, was All right. that was Travis's fault. That, well, he, he got $7 million on a $1 million case right. is what he ended up with. But anyway, uh, but the reality is this. So we are going to be talking about creative and innovative advocacy, not, not the run-of-the-mill stuff that you see in other, in other uh, presentations. I'm going to show the actual video clips. I'm going to show you the true false. I'm going to show you the roadmaps. Those roadmaps are gigantic. They're absolutely unbelievable. And, and I can't thank Mark Lanier enough for teaching it to me. I mean, the guy's unbelievable. The guy's unbelievable. But so I've taken his road mapping. I've taken the true false questions. I've taken the demonstrative aids. I've taken the three camera depositions, right? And we're making it so that it fits my personality. So it fits my cases. Now, this, this needs to fit the, the audience's cases. You're not me. I'm not you. I'm not Lanier. I'm not Panish. I'm not those guys. I'm Dino Colombo. And so, but I want to give you guys ideas about how to make it work in your everyday practice. You know, we have, we have coined the phrase depositions are trial. All right. And they absolutely are. We are no longer taking discovery depositions as in a traditional sense where we want to know, where we, we want to take the, the background. That's bullshit. I, I don't care about that. I'm getting right to the point. I know what I want to ask. We're setting the rules of the road. We're going to set up the rules. We're going to knock them down with each and every one of these witnesses so that they have nowhere to go. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what that talk is going to be about a TLU in, in New York City. It's fantastic. I'm, I, if, I'm like, already, if I may I'm say so myself, and with, I am completely unbiased and objective, but my presentation is amazing and you don't want to miss it. I'm just talking objective. That's right. That's I, what I, I want to say. I got to be blunt about it. because, But, you know, you might consider... So, Anyway. Uh, you know, I have a separate idea, but we'll talk about it later is, uh, you know, doing like a, a on your feet workshop on direct examination using roadmaps. So people have their own witness. Okay. How do I do a roadmap for this doctor? Cool. And then how do I incorporate it with it? Because until people get on their, off their asses on their feet, get a marker out and, a, you know, and the, um, butcher paper or, you know, a, uh, Elmo that they're doing it with, they're never going to do it in the trial because it's too far out of their comfort zones and they haven't practiced it. it ain't going to happen. Well, it, it, and it's the practice, okay? Because what we've done is when we go, when we go in a deposition and we're going to use a roadmap, we've already done the roadmap. I already know what it's going to say or for the most part, right? Right? So I, ha I, have, I have a roadmap. I have a roadmap already filled in that I set to the side that I am using as my template. And then I am taking the witness through the entire roadmap as I understand it to be. Now, sometimes you get a curve, no question about it. You got to be able to, to work with that curveball. But 98% of the time, it's what we expect it to be. I, I had a, I tell the story and people think I'm kidding. I had a defense lawyer object to the roadmap. And here was the objection because they were so flustered by it. They said, objection it's persuasive. That's what they those, said. Those are the kind of right? objections that you get the it's transcript, perfect. you highlight it, and you put it on every social media platform you can because that's just so it shows how far out of their heads they are. Like, objection, it's clarifying well, the point they, too well. They've not seen it. Right. They've not seen it. And if I would have been a defense lawyer back at, and, and had seen some of this, I wouldn't know what the hell to do either. I mean, I'm, we're, we're having witnesses, you know, the, the 30B witnesses check off the true false, hold it up there like a mug shot. We've got all kinds of ideas about how to prove the point. Because what Lanier has taught me, and I hope to teach others, is that, and you've heard this term, a, a picture is, is worth a thousand words. And that's absolutely true. And if you look in our society today, YouTube has so how many visitors? Uh, you, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, they're all, everybody wants TikTok. They're all based on video. They don't want people just to, to say words to them, to read to them. They want to see demonstrative evidence because they will learn so much more and remember so much more if they see it. And I want them to see the rules. And then I want them to see how the defendant violated those rules. That's far better than me telling them the rules. Yes, we agree. Well, let's move on from there and talk about this recent verdict, because you recently, or Travis yes. got, uh, you know, the seven and a half million dollar verdict. So tell us about that case. 
Give us the, I call it yeah. the um, condensed preview. What's the case about? Who got hurt? What happened to yeah. them? Just so we can understand it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was a case in, in Springfield, Ohio. Travis Moeller, my associate, my son, Nathan Colombo, they were both on the case. I was brought in as, and, and I, as I was telling somebody, I was the, I was the manager. I was like the manager of a ball club. So those two guys tried the case, primarily Travis, and I coached them through it. It was um, a, a case involving a truck accident, a flatbed truck that had backed across a two-lane road uh, very, very early in the morning while it was still dark. Our client was on his way to work, uh, going in the opposite direction of this two-lane road. As the flatbed trailer was, was backing across his lane of traffic, he didn't see it in time, slammed on his brakes, and basically there was an underride situation where he went underneath the flatbed trailer and was severely injured. Had a brain bleed that he, that healed okay, but his primary injury was a severely fractured hip, and he had to have had to have three surgeries to to finally repair the hip. He ended up with a leg length discrepancy of about an inch, which is pretty significant. Yeah, and. Yeah. Um, and he had to walk with a cane and was disabled. So the, the case was was a case involving the fact that he had blocked that the truck driver had blocked this this uh, two lane road, didn't had no warning, no no flaggers, no traffic control devices, nothing. And he the, the trucker and the the steel company who hired the trucker blamed our client entirely. It said it was your fault. You should have seen the truck. We had reflective tape. We had uh, the flashing lights going. Uh, on the side of the truck that you should have seen it in plenty of time and it was your fault you must have been distracted in some fashion and you should have seen it and gotten stopped so we tried the case for about a week and a half uh they had the defense had done a visibility study that's that's was the the key piece of their evidence where they had an engineer uh come in and they basically recreated the collision our client was driving a Ford F-150. They set up cameras in the F-150, got about the same type of lighting, uh, and did this drive-through video and said, you know, about 800 feet, you should have been able to see the truck and stop. I won't go into the details of, of their study and the mistakes that were made because there is now a motion for sanctions in addition to the $7 million, $10,000 verdict, uh, which was paid, by the way. Um, so what happens Aren't is you, greedy? Yeah, I'll tell you, you got that paid and you so want sanctions? I love it. Absolutely. And and we are we are very much deserving of the sanctions in this because of the uh of what I would consider extremely uh, inappropriate behavior by not only the expert witnesses uh but potentially the lawyers and the uh and maybe the defendant himself. So at the end of the day, the jury found our client to have no fault in this. They assessed him no liability. They found that the defendant driver was not only negligent, but reckless. Uh, we only had $350,000 in, in medical did bills. Did we waive them? Uh, and they had, We'll talk no, we about that during case analysis. Case. Yes, we did not waive it on that. And we ended up with a $7,000,000, $10,000 $10, verdict. And uh, because there was a reckless, there was a finding that the, the defendant was reckless, punitive damages was the next phase, which was going to be my part of the case. So I was going to be trying the punitive damage phase of the case. So what we did at the end of the day, the verdict came in around 630 in the evening. Uh, we approached the defense lawyers and we said, look, we're going to start punitive damages one o'clock the following day. Uh, we'll give you to 1030 in the morning the next day. If you pay the verdict, the seven million ten thousand dollars, we'll forego and forego an appeal to pay the ten seven million ten thousand. Uh, we will forego the punitive damages. About ten thirty the next morning, they agreed to pay it. And in fact, we just got paid. Well, last it sounds week. like there's going to be a party in New York City with Colombo Law. <laughs> I, I love it. People tell me how they got it. I'm like, oh, drinks so, and dinner are on you. I love it. So, so I want to be clear. Travis Moeller is the one who deserves the credit for this. He did a fantastic job in this case. My son Nathan did a fantastic job helping Travis. We all prepped together. We worked every night together. As I said, I was I was the uh, the, the major league uh, manager in the back, and I was coming out of the bullpen to do the punitive damage phase, and then they agreed to pay the case. So that's how it went. We were happy with the result. The client was extraordinarily happy. Wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, just... He and his family were just fantastic people. And, you know, you hear this all the time, but it really was an honor to represent him. He got blamed for things he never did. It was such bullshit to begin with. 
he was he was he he was victimized or they tried to victimize him but we just wouldn't let it happen and he prevailed and prevailed in a big big way couldn't have been happier i am looking forward to this program on september 5th but just you know what would you say because i know every time we try cases we learn stuff so give us what your like you know the biggest thing you learned from this case the biggest thing I learned from that case is is that you don't say don't tell the jury something you Well you knew that already, prove. Dino. You didn't right? have to learn that there from watching some dumb defense lawyer do it and pull yeah. it up full of shit. Yeah, but but it really but but the point though is no one knows exactly how the evidence is going to come in, right? I mean, you, you think you know, and you tell them an opening statement, and you damn well better be, be sure that it is what it is, right? When you tell them what the evidence is going to be, it, it better be what, what you say it is. But sometimes, and in this case for the defense lawyer, for a lot of reasons, it didn't go the way they planned. They didn't change anything. They just kept saying the same ridiculous things over and over and over. And Dan, what you said at the beginning of this podcast is true, that oftentimes, if not the 50 to 60 percent of the times, the big verdicts come from mistakes from opposing counsel. And that that had a lot to do with this because they lost their credibility. And not only did they lose it, they kicked it down the road. They kicked it down the road. And then when they got up to it again, they kicked it a little further for absolutely no reason. The point is, there are gonna be weaknesses in everybody's case. Own up to them, address them, try to turn those weaknesses into strengths and tell the jury why they're not as bad as the, as the defense thinks they are. Be upfront with them. It builds your credibility. Cre this, these cases are all about credibility. I said, juries don't understand all the facts, but they know who's telling the truth. At the end of the day, Travis Moeller and Nathan Colombo were telling the truth. The defense lawyers didn't appear to be. And that was the difference in that All case. All right, and here's my final question. What was your, other than the yes. verdict being read and paid, what was your highlight, favorite moment of the case? The, the, when you look back on this trial, you look at that moment, you live it in your mind, and you smile. Yeah. That's easy, actually, in this case. The key piece of evidence that got, uh, that I told you was this uh, uh, video of trying to recreate the accident. Uh, after some shenanigans that the defendants had pulled, the judge struck the video and told the jury not to, or told the jury to disregard the testimony on that whole issue. That was their whole case. While on the stand, this uh, mechanical engineer who works for a very substantial company, SEA, began to cry on the witness stand. Wait. And cry. The engineer, wait, but the engineer was a, a, a male? A male. A male engineer, because his credibility had been hurt so bad that he began to cry on the witness stand. Okay? You can't top that. I'm, I've been a lawyer 35 years, Dan. Tried a lot of cases, seen a lot of crazy stuff. Never saw that. W this witness asked to be sworn in a second time. Like the first one didn't take. At a, at a, he got sworn in when he first took the stand, sworn in, went through about an hour's worth of testimony, an issue came up with this video, jury was taken out of the, the jury, out of the courtroom, put in the jury room. We argued the, the issue, we prevailed, the, the video got struck, jury was told to disregard the evidence, and the witness asked to be re-sworn in. And the judge didn't know what to do. He went ahead and swore him in. And the guy, the judge says, would you raise your right hand? The guy so shook, he raised his left hand. Sat down, started crying. You know what? I can see why that'd be favorite moments. I can see why. Well. It was wonderful. It was, it was a great experience, and, and we're happy, yeah. obviously, with the result. And and, um, a couple things are yeah. this, before we wrap up here, is, so we're going to do this at September 5th, I think 1 p.m., I'm in West Virginia, 10 a.m. in uh, California, and everybody else had to figure out in between what they're doing. Um, and, and so I'll see you there, but I'll see you, uh, well, I see you in person next week at the AHA in Philadelphia? I will not. I'm oh, going to be right. on vacation well, that'll next be week. Better. Well, I'll be on vacation in Philadelphia with my yeah. trial lawyer friends. And, and then, you know, New York City is going to be, I will, New York City's gonna be great. We got, like I said, the four lecture tracks, seven workshop tracks. It's going to be the most awesome trial lawyers event that's ever come to the Eastern Seaboard. I am certain of this. So hopefully we'll all see you there.
You know, we had we had a knockdown drag out out in Vegas. We had a great time. A lot of people. It was fantastic. No, that Last was year great. In so we're going to replace that program this year with New York City and get a little East Coast love is what we call it. Well, Dino, great spending this time with there you, you go, getting baby. to know you a little bit better and get some of your uh, your philosophies and views on trial lawyering. And, you know, for me, it's always it's like like I love these things because because you get a chance to meet people and get to know them. And then you see them, you have a different relationship because now it's like no more their story, who they are. And, and that's what life's about is friends, relationships, and stories and finding, finding some money justice no out there. So congratulations to Travis and um, who's that? Wait, Travis, your son, I know Travis Moller, your son is Travis and Nathan, 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 Colombo. Nathan Colombo. I know I met him many times. I just, I, got, I bumped my head as a kid, so I, I, work, I, got, I need a lot of uh, visual re re refreshers to get it all. But anyway, you have a great rest of your day, okay. and uh, I'll see you soon. Take see care. Bye-bye. Join us September 20th to 23rd in New York City for TLU Live. We're going to have some of the greatest trial lawyers in the country coming, from Brian Panish, Ben Morelli, Judy Livingston, Joe Freed, Zoe Littlepage, Rex Paris, and the list goes on and on. And not only will we have four lecture tracks, but we're going to have seven workshop tracks where you can work on and hone a specific skill in a small group taught by a great trial lawyer. The website is tlunyc.com. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at triallawyersuniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to tluondemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University, produced and powered by LawPods.